Over the past couple years, I've grown a strong interest in Jewish culture and looking into Jesus' history and his culture. I've done some research and found some really great authors. And a few years ago, I went to a session at a Christian conference and listened to this guy named Joe Amaral. And I just love the way he opens up historical context of the Bible. And he has a great website called First Century Foundations. And I've spent so much time researching, uh, just inspired because of Joe Amaral and his passion for Jewish culture. I also really love Ray Zanderlan from Focus on the Family and he does a great video session that is also wonderful and plops you into the cultural relevance of Jesus Day. So those are two great resources that I have used over the years as I have developed this, um, this passion and interest in Jewish culture. So let's, let's move on. Did you know that Jesus was Jewish? I know, I'm sure lots of you are thinking that I'm pretty strange and think, what? Say what? Jesus is Jewish? And, and maybe lots of you are thinking, well, yeah, of course I knew that. But I think it shocks a lot of people to know, to let it sink in and really ponder that Jesus was Jewish. I think we we think Jesus wasn't Jewish because he's a Christian, right? He's the founder of Christianity. How can he be Jewish? But of course he was. Jesus knew every law, every custom, the way of their Hebraic roots because he was taught and trained in Jewish customs. That was his surroundings. And I think sometimes we forget this. And I know for me personally, I've almost gone the other way at times, making Jesus as current as I possibly can. And I've, I've often fallen into this trap of trying to secularize Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm sure if he was here in our day, he'd be sitting in blue jeans and wearing a, a t-shirt if his time was here on earth, was now here on earth, and not 2,000 years ago. He was so current and so relevant to the audience that he was with. And so I think if Jesus were to walk into this room today, he would say stuff like, what's up? And I know, right? He'd be texting or emailing me and talking to me um, in his story and parable way. And he'd still be communicating the same message. I, that wouldn't change, but he would be relevant and current to, to the surroundings that he was in. And so I often think that I imply this current view upon Jesus. And, um, and you know that biblical reference where it talks about how we aren't to add yeast to the bread? It says, don't add yeast to the bread. It's like adding sin to our lives. Well, I think if Jesus was here in our time, he would probably talk about a computer virus and how a virus can get into our computer, destroy our pictures and files, and eat up everything in its path. And it's just like sin. When we bring sin into our lives, it eats up everything in its path. I think, I think Jesus was that way. He spoke everything in a relevant way to his followers. And instead of using yeast as his reference 2,000 years ago, if he was here in our day, he'd probably use a computer, computer virus, something techie that would be relevant to our generations. That's just who he was. Now, when we see pictures of Jesus, they're always of him in traditional robes and clothing. And I'm sure that's exactly what he looked like 2,000 years ago because he was relevant. That's what they would wear. He wouldn't be wearing anything different or speak anything differently than his surroundings of the day. Now, of course, his message was so different than the day. But what I mean by that is that he was relevant. He used the things that were in his surroundings to be able to effectively communicate to his listeners. 
The Bible says that he would speak of things in ways that people could easily understand. He didn't talk above people's heads. He knew his audience and he spoke to them. So let's back up just a little bit. Jesus isn't here presently in human form at this time. Of course, we have the Holy Spirit, but Jesus isn't humanly here on the earth. He came to the earth 2,000 years ago, and things were very different then. Culture was very different then. People didn't have cars. They had donkeys. People didn't text. They had to walk to their neighbor's house to share news of what was going on in their day. People didn't have refrigerators. They had ice caves or straw or salt to keep their food preserved. There's just three quick cultural differences that I mentioned off the top of my head, and yet they completely change a person's lifestyle. And yet when we jump into the Word of God and read the stories that Jesus told without any cultural contact, which we really do love to do, sometimes we miss the meaning. From the famous words of Veggie Tales, and so what we have learned applies to our lives today. God has a lot to say in his book. So, so many times I've sang that song with my kids. And yes, there are questions that are so important. And God's word is timeless. But how much more would we glean? How much more would we learn from this book that God is communicating to us if we had some cultural understanding? When we understand Jesus' culture, we can understand better the stories that he shared that are still relevant to us today, absolutely. But they take on a whole new meaning when we know his history, his surroundings, his environment, what was going on around him that made him choose to use that example as he communicated to the people that were listening in his day and now still 2,000 years ago. So I want to share a story with you from Matthew chapter 25. It's the story of the ten bridesmaids or virgins. And yes, I like weddings. I like them a lot, but that's not why I chose this passage. Let me read this to you. And this is in the New Living Translation. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. It would be so easy for us to read these verses and impose our own thoughts of weddings, brides, bridegrooms onto this story. For me personally, I would imagine extravagant budgets preparations for months, if not years, flowers, dresses, decorations, invitations, 
everything that goes with today's wedding. We could apply it to this story, but we wouldn't have the right context. Let's not look at a current wedding to unpack this parable, but let's go back to Jesus' day and see what a Jewish wedding would look like. Getting married in ancient Israel was not as, as simple as buying a ring, asking the girl to get hitched, and to start planning the flowers or which cousin you were going to ask to be a bridesmaid. It was common in ancient Israel for the father of the groom to select a bride for his son. And you know, I've joked a lot with my kids over the years that I don't think this is a bad idea. Hey, how could it hurt having a little input as to what your your son's bride will be like and uh, and her family? But of course, I'm just joking. I think it's completely up to him who he chooses to marry. But in this day, the father of the groom would be the one to select the bride for his son. When it came time for a man to marry, he would first have to go to the young woman's house to present not only to her, but to her father as well, with a betrothal contract. This document clearly outlined to the young woman and her father how the young man would provide for his bride. He would state his occupation, his salary, living arrangements, as well as his general plans and intentions for this young woman. This example here would not gain the approval of a bride's father in biblical times. Occupation? Unemployed surfer dude who likes to surf the lakes of northern British Columbia. Salary? Canadian tire money. Living arrangements? A bedroom in my parents' basement. Life goals? Graduate high school by the age of 40 and get a job at McDonald's flipping burgers. No, this would not gain the approval of the bride's father. This was a very serious proposal, and the, the groom needed to present the best side of, of himself to the bride and her father. The contract would often look something like this. And I'm going to just insert a little picture here into my video to show you an ancient contract. Notice the elaborate decorations and the artwork and the handwriting on the contract. All of this would state from the groom what he was proposing to the bride and her family. This next slide is a present day contract that is also called a ketuba and you can go online and pur purchase a ketuba and then fill in all your own personal information to the contract. The next part of the betrothal around the contract or ketuba was the bride's price and it was called the mohar. The bride's price was a gift from the groom to the bride's family to pay for the bride. Ultimately, this was a gift for the bride and it changed her status and set her free from dependence on her parents. The question of the contract was, how much was this young man willing to pay for his young bride? Not only did the bride's price show the family the deep commitment and love the groom had for the bride, but it was to compensate the family for the loss of their daughter. The higher the price, the deeper the demonstration of love for the bride, and it was also a key as to how wealthy the groom's family was. The next step of the engagement between the man and woman involved the pouring and drinking of the cup. The man would pour out a cup of wine and offer it to the woman. If she accepted the cup and drank the wine, that meant that she and her family accepted the proposal and the contract. This meant that the couple were now legally bound together at this moment, and it was almost like they were married. There was no consummation of the marriage and no wedding ceremony yet, but in all other ways, they were considered married from this moment on. If the man wanted to call the wedding off, and only the man, the man was allowed to call the wedding off now at this point, 
So if he wanted to call it off, it wasn't just as simple as saying, no, I'm not interested, I don't want to marry her anymore. He would actually have to get a certificate of divorce. And in those days, the woman just could not call the wedding off now at this point. The man would take the cup of wine back from the bride and drink it, which would symbolize his acceptance of the marriage as well. So following this betrothal ceremony, the groom would head home to fulfill his engagement obligations to the marriage. Just prior to leaving, he would give his wife-to-be a gift, a bridal gift and a pledge of love for her. It was supposed to be a reminder to her of his love for her. So in the days of separation, she would look at that gift or use that gift and she would be reminded of him. Sometimes the groom would give something like a very valuable or precious hairbrush so that each day when the bride was brushing her hair, she would be thinking of her groom. They were not allowed to be um, able to see each other. They were just not permitted to see each other from this betrothal ceremony until, um, until the wedding ceremony. And the engagement would often last 12 to 18 months while preparations were being made. So the groom, and these preparations are much different than in our culture, the groom was to go and to prepare a new dwelling for his bride and her, their future family together. In biblical times, they would most often build a new home, um, but it would be attached to their father's house. So they wouldn't go and build a house in a different location, but instead they would add on to their father's house. And lots of times it would actually be like a second floor or a third floor, um, depending on the location of the father's house and, and how many other sons that there were that were also building on and adding on to the house and building their own place. That would one day be the place that they would welcome their beautiful bride into as their future home together. Now, it was not the groom's duty to decide when the home was ready. That was up to his father to decide and to give the go-ahead and the blessing to go and get the bride. So if the groom is taking his sweet time and not getting the house built, it's going to take a long time before he gets his bride. And I just love that uh, it keeps the keeps the groom motivated to know that when the house is finished, uh, then and only then at that point would the father consider being, um, being able to welcome the bride into the groom's home. So if others would ask the groom, when is your bride coming? He would say, I don't know. Only my father knows the day and the time. The bride, at the same time, is also keeping herself busy. She's preparing and sewing the wedding garments for her and her groom. One of the unique features of the biblical Hebraic wedding was the time of the groom's arrival. It was to be a surprise, and I just love the romance of this idea. The bride took the betrothal seriously, expecting the groom at the end of about 12 months. So she knew she needed to get those wedding clothes um, sewn and, and ready to go within about 12 months. That was the approximate timing because she too didn't know the day or the hour that her groom would arrive. Traditionally, the groom would come in the night, and so she would have her bags packed and ready, her lamp was filled with oil beside her bed, awaiting the arrival of her groom. Finally, the father of the groom would release his son to go and get his bride. What an exciting day! And this is my favorite part. It is so romantic. It was customary for one of the groom's party to go ahead of the bridegroom, leading the way to the little town where the bride was from. And he would shout, Behold, the bridegroom comes! Behold, the bridegroom comes! Then the sounding of the shofar, and the shofar was a large ram's horn that they would blow in the dead of the night. And at the sound of the shofar, 
all of the girls in the town that were betrothed would light their lamps and go and see if it was their groom. They needed to be ready. Was it their groom? Was it their man that they were to be married to? They needed to have oil in their lamps because it was pitch black and they wouldn't be able to see two feet in front of them. And if they didn't have oil in their lamp and light to see, how would the bride know it was her groom if she couldn't see him? Would she know the sound of his voice? And if he, he too needed to be able to see her, so she needed to have that lamp ready. Remember, she hasn't seen him in about a year. And if you haven't seen somebody in, a, in about a year, you're going to need as much light as you can possibly get to make sure that you have the right person. Now, if she missed this opportunity, the groom could divorce her. So if she was a real heavy sleeper and missed the sound of the shofar and the shouting, if she was not prepared and ready and did not go out when she was supposed to go out, the groom could divorce her. But at this point, the bride would go out to the groom and they would enter the wedding ceremony and they would proceed through the streets of the city and the bride and groom would be one. They would head into their wedding ceremony. They would say a blessing over the cup of wine. The ceremony would be finalized and there would be the promise vows. The pinnacle of this joyful celebration was the marriage supper, and it was more than just a sit-down dinner. It was a party. It was seven full days of food and dancing and music and celebration. It was a party. After the festivities, the groom was free to bring his bride back to their new home dwelling that he had been preparing for them. So how does this passage and the information of the ancient Jewish wedding form our hearts and deepen our relationship with our Father? Because relationship with God isn't about giving up something or forfeiting something. It's about formation. And formation is about getting ourselves ready to receive Christ. We want to become more like him in every single thing that we do. So how does this Jewish wedding help us to understand and to deepen our relationship with Jesus and our Father? Well, let's look back at the Jewish wedding and see how God is calling us to be ready. There are so many parallels. And this isn't just a fluke. This isn't an accident. This is, this is done on purpose. Let's look at the marriage contract and the bride's price. It says in Ephesians 1.4 that we have been selected by the Father to be His beloved Son's loving bride. You and me. And in respect to the bride's price, Jesus said that He would pay for it with His life. Remember the amount of the bride's price was determined by the level of love that was shown by the groom? Well, how great is the love that Jesus gives and shows to us by giving his full entire life. There is no greater gift of love than one's life. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1.18, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Doesn't that just give you goosebumps? Jesus paid for your life with his own Jesus also gave us gifts as his bride, just as the groom did give gifts to his bride in the historical Jewish wedding. Ephesians 4 says, He gives gifts, gifts to each of us, and several of these are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. Jesus left us with gifts for one specific reason, to remind us of him. 
just like the groom gave a gift to the bride to remind the bride of the groom. And so every time we exercise one of our spiritual gifts, we should be bringing attention and glory to Jesus who gave us those gifts to remind us of him. The scriptures point to the fact that we are betrothed to the Messiah. And I believe that we are in an engagement period right now. And as with any betrothal, the promise is so sure of our wedding that it would take a divorce to nullify the contract. And the option of divorce, remember, is only available to the husband. So we as the bride, we cannot divorce God. Only he can offer divorce. And Jesus promises us that he will make us his wife forever, showing us righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. Jesus will be faithful to us and we will be his and we will know him as Lord. It says in Hosea 2, 19 and 20, And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Would God ever divorce us? No, that is not in his character. Not at all. And so we are betrothed and committed and joined to our Father forever. The lesson and implications are quite clear. We are secure in our Messiah's contract with us. We cannot break it. We as the bride cannot. And he promises that he will never break it. How can we not humble ourselves to our loving Savior who gives everything for us, who set up a contract with us, who gives his life as payment, who gives us good gifts, how do we not receive that and be changed? The next part of the betrothal included the blessings of the wine. One of the last of Jesus' actions was to bless the cup of the new covenant at his final Passover supper. He would provide for this covenant with the breaking of his body and by the shedding of his blood to fulfill the requirements necessary to keep the covenant with us. Je Jesus clearly stated that he would not taste again until a later time when he would drink at the wedding feast. Isn't that just amazing how he's tying this all together? And so the groom prepares a home and, and how is the Messiah fulfilling his obligations to prepare a home? Well, it says in John 14, 1 to 3, that Jesus has gone to prepare heaven for us. And when it's ready, he will come back and he will get us and he will take us to our new dwelling, our new home, which is heaven. We need to ask ourselves if we're preparing for him. Are we arrayed in our bridal attire? Are we keeping our covenant promises and vows with him? Because the bride of Christ, that's us. We're called to be consecrated and set apart for him. Our task at this point is to prepare ourselves for his return. Are we preparing for him? Because we must never lose sight of this focus, of this covenant, of this betrothal that we have entered into with our Jesus, our Lord. Jesus told the disciples that he didn't know the day or hour of his return in Matthew 28. Only the Father knows, God the Father. Jesus wasn't saying that he didn't have the knowledge but as with any Hebraic bridegroom, he must wait for the okay, for the time from his father, the blessing that the wedding day has come. And Jesus didn't know, doesn't know that day. Only God the Father knows that day. And to me, this is the most significant part, back to the romance of the groom coming in the night to get his bride. 
And I love this romantic picture that Christ is coming back in the night to get me, to get you. Christ will come for us. And Paul makes reference to this in 1 Thessalonians 5, that we do not know the time or date, but that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Jesus, my Jesus, will come for me. And as the sheep know the sound of the shepherd's voice, do I know the sound of my bridegroom? Well, I know it's him when he comes. I have to share this quick little story with you about knowing the sound of your shepherd's voice. L long time ago, I was in a, a mentoring relationship with two beautiful, wonderful ladies, and they their names were Pam and Sue. And I had met them only once, uh, years and years ago, uh, just through our denomination, and we had had a wonderful visit with each other, and we really connected and clicked and decided that we would continue our mentoring relationship on the phone. And so we did this because they lived in a, a totally different city, very far away from where I lived, about an eight-hour drive. So we would phone each other and pray for each other and encourage each other, and they really mentored me and took me under their wing and just loved me. And so we spent two to three years uh, talking together on the phone once a month, praying for each other and, and just building our relationship. And so I had met them only once and then years had gone by of us talking on the phone. And so I knew the sound of their voices, uh, but I had actually forgotten what they looked like. And so I was at a conference in another city and when I entered into this room, I saw this woman that looked so familiar, but I couldn't place who she was. Um, and I used to be a pastor in the same city where I was at this conference. And so I thought maybe she was from my previous church, but I just couldn't place where I knew her from. I recognized her, but I couldn't figure it out. And um, so as, as part of this conference, it was a small group, and we were asked to introduce ourselves. And so we went around the room, and interestingly enough, this lady sat right beside me, and we hadn't had a chance to talk because the session had started, so we needed to just introduce ourselves. So I started to introduce myself. I stood up first, and um, as soon as I said my name, the lady that was beside me that I had recognized, she burst into laughter and I thought wow that's kind of rude she threw me off actually I didn't really know how to respond I didn't think my name was that funny but I thought maybe the way I said it was entertaining or something I don't know but I, I kept on and I finished my introduction of who I was where I was from blah 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 and then I sat down and then the lady that was next to me she got up and she said Hello, my name is Pam. <laughs> she introduced herself and I realized as soon as I heard her voice that it was the Pam that I talked to once a month on the phone that had been mentoring me and we'd only met once in person and I, I couldn't place her face but I knew her voice. As soon as she stood to share her name and where she was from, I knew her voice and I too started to giggle because it, uh, it was just too funny that we didn't recognize each other, but we knew each other's voice. And, and this, this story with Pam reminds me, I knew her voice, I knew the sound of it. And do I know the sound of my Jesus voice? Well, I know it's him when he comes back to get me. Because really, I don't know what he looks like for real. I have an idea of what I think he's going to look like. But really, I don't know exactly what Jesus looks like. Will I know the sound of his voice when he comes to get me, to take me back to his, the home that he has been preparing for us? In the Hebraic wedding, remember back to that, to the wedding party, the groomsmen would go before the groom and announce that the groom was coming. And he would say, behold, the bridegroom comes. And should we as the bride of Christ expect anything less? And where do we see such event? 
Well, if you turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, and 18, you see that just prior to the Master's return, there will indeed be a commanding shout just before Jesus comes. One of the ruling angels will shout something so incredible. And, and what do you think it will be? It will be, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Oh, I can hardly wait for that day. It brings such joy to think of that day. As I said before, the pinnacle of the Hebrew wedding was the marriage supper. This too is a facet of our master's soon coming wedding, where in Revelations 19 it says, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Our bridegroom, Jesus, is the Lamb. And now when we read Matthew 25, we read five bridesmaids were ready. They had oil in their lamp. Their bags were packed. They were prepared. They were ready for the groom that would come in the night. They were ready for the sound of the shofar that would take them off to their wedding celebration. They knew the sound of their groom's voice. But there were also five girls in Matthew 25 that were not ready, and they were left behind. And what an amazing story, now that we know the history, the tradition, the Hebraic roots of the Jewish wedding. And so am I ready? Are you ready? Are we taking time now in this betrothal period to shape and form our hearts to look more and more like our bridegroom, Jesus? Are we giving up ourselves, laying down our sinful nature and, and picking up the promises and the covenant that Jesus so willingly gives to each of us? Because it's like going with Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days that we come face to face with our ugly sin so that Jesus can forgive it, cast it away as far as the east is from the west. And that through our small sacrifice, we might become more like Jesus. I encourage you to let the things of this world fall away so that you can fall in love with Christ. It's not about giving up something. It's not about rules or rituals or laws. And so often we focus on all the things that we have to let go of how about we focus on the things that we get to pick up? How about we focus on being formed, conformed, transformed into Christ-likeness? That there would be a metamorphosis in our hearts for Jesus' glory so that when he returns, we know that it's him and he knows that it's us because we've already established a loving, beautiful relationship with him here on earth. One of my favorite authors, Anne Voskamp, says, She who knows her sins much, loves much. And the road to heaven is paved with the realization that I deserve hell. His rising will be all my joy because I know it in the marrow of my bones. He is all my hope. For it is by grace you have been saved by faith, and this, not from ourselves, is a gift from God, not by works so that anyone can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I challenge you, but I challenge myself mostly. Am I ready? Am I ready for my bridegroom that will come? Is there oil in my lamp? Am I prepared for my Father that will come in His glory to get me one day? As I spend time with Him every single day, I know that I draw closer to Him, learning more about His character, trusting in who He is, and what He has done for me. And I hope you will do the same. 
Thanks for listening.